quick recap because it's been a minute since uh, we've been in the Gospel of Luke. And Luke is recognized as one of the, the most accurate uh, historians going around, L accurate historian of late antiquity. And he's also just happens to be a follower of Jesus. And he wrote down as he starts, he says, I'm writing this orderly account about this historic figure called Jesus. And he says, I'm using eyewitnesses accounts of the life of Jesus and so he wrote this gospel story and we've been looking at what the gospel is and what those stories look like over the last three weeks and here's, here's Luke's story about who Jesus is and what he's accomplished among us he says so that we can hear this story and as we hear it and receive it we can have this unshakable faith in Jesus as God's salvation who makes people fit for the coming kingdom of God. And like I said, it's been, it's been a quick minute since we've looked at it. So on Monday morning, I sort of got into my office and I thought I'll read through the Gospel of uh, Luke. And as, I, and as I did, I was, I was kind of struck by how present the theme of the kingdom of God is. It, it just stands out all the time. And Jesus' intention to preach the good news of this kingdom. And then as he preaches the good news of this kingdom, he accompanies that preaching with, with miracles that kind of demonstrate and validate this kingdom uh, that he is preaching. And it says that the demise of one kingdom is coming and the beginning of another kingdom has arrived. Throughout Luke's gospel, we see that Jesus... Uh, in, uh, in Jesus, the kingdom of God is, is breaking in and it's taking hold and it's pushing back uh, the darkness and the decay uh, from sin and its power uh, over people's lives and, and its presence in the world. And we get to chapter 4 where Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God is upon me because he has appointed me to proclaim good news, to proclaim the message of this kingdom. Who to? to the poor, to those who, who need it, to those who see their need of it. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovering sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the glory of God, his favor seen in the weak, those who, who's, who are bound by sins, decay, sins, power, being made strong by the receiving of, of this good news, this kingdom, re, uh, receiving a new quality of life and indeed a place in this kingdom that Jesus is proclaiming. This kingdom breaks in through the person and the work of Jesus. And, and as we went through the gospel, we realized it's an upside down kingdom because this kingdom uses its power and its resources to restore human flourishing to lift up people, to, to make them whole again, and, and not just for its own sake, but for the glory of God. Unlike the kingdoms of the world that use their power and their resources to dominate, control, and oppress people and others, and, and to kind of remove the necessity for God and his relevance in the world. This kingdom we, we saw takes hold in unnoticeable uh, and unlikely ways. It's described as being as small as a mustard seed or a bit of leaven, and it belongs to the unlikely uh, and the lowly, like, 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 like little children. They are who Jesus is, is calling a new community of people out of. These are the people who perceive that God is reconciling people and creation back to him through, through this Jesus. And so we see Jesus going from synagogue to synagogue, teaching and calling people to repentance and life in him, a life that <coughs> dies to sin's grip and power to distort our affections, to, to, to disorder our loves and our affections and our lives, and to have that replaced with affection for God and his beautiful design for life as presented by Jesus. And we see Jesus, as Dan said last week, going from meal to meal, person to person, explaining how he makes sin-sick people whole and new. And then he backs up these claims of being able to overthrow the spiritual uh, decay in the world with, with physical, actual healings and miracles, the signs that, that sin is on the retreat. 
even claiming that he can forgive sins. Jesus is pushing across the table that he is ultimate reality and he's bringing a new ultimate reality into people's lives. The lepers, the blame, the lion, the sick, um, the, the mentally and demonically oppressed, all restored back to health and community. <laughs> and after three years of this, Jesus is just trending. And many are saying, or they're asking the question, is this Jesus, the great prophet, the great agent of God, whose words and miracles have the transformative uh, power that is ascribed to the ministry of the messianic servant of the Lord, the Messiah? He's a mysterious figure. And, and when you see the word, whenever you see, like most of the time, when you see the word mystery in the Bible, that means God is going to reveal it. You don't have to figure it out. It, a mysterious figure who is predicted to arrive uh, to put all things right, to bring God's kingdom of justice and peace and to restore and consummate, you know, God's people. That's, that's what's trending. Is this the guy? And the more Jesus trends, the more the religious institution are suspicious of him because, well, he doesn't act like an, an, a normal religious person. He's a friend of sinners. And you don't build religious movements with outcasts. But as we read through the Gospel of Luke, we saw that Jesus is actually this outcast collector. And Jesus is not eating with these people to affirm their ways of life and just say, hey, you know, you do you, bro. You just, you just, you just be your best true self. No, he's eating with them to intervene. On their true selves and to invite them to no longer be enslaved to sin and self, but rather to find a greater reality of life in him, in Jesus, an identity attached to who Jesus is and what he will do. That's why he's eaten with these people. He's yet there sharing his story. And we've been talking about that for the last three weeks. How do we go and share our story with people? The good news of the kingdom of God as Jesus proclaims it, is not so much found in restored environments and conditions, but in him. He is the actual good news. He is the means of new life and peace with God. Jesus is the sermon. Jesus is the good news. God's blessing is an actual person. And it's your relationship and your response to that person of Jesus that determines your place in the kingdom of God and determines whether you understand the nature of this kingdom. And this just enrages the establishment even more. And they're like, we have to kill this guy. Uh, he's, he's making himself out to be equal with God. And that's their conversation as it trends on. But everyone else is like, we have to make this guy king. No one else can do the things that he is doing. And this kind of... Um, expression plays itself out from the people as Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the donkey like they're laying down their blankets and their palms and hail you know the king who comes against both these narratives Jesus has been saying I'm, I'm not the kind of of threat to your power or the kind of king that you think I am I am a far greater one like I am a far greater threat to your self-righteousness and I am a far greater threat to your self-actualization, your self-gratification than you could ever dare to imagine. And I am a king whose kingdom is not modeled on the kingdoms of this world. What's more, I can only become the kind of king you need, not by exerting power, but by dying. My kingship lies on the other side of a cross. My, my kingdom I leave behind will be like a mustard seed, but it will grow and the gates of hell will not prevail and it will continue to reclaim what sin has held captive until it's ready for me to return and then I'll be the kind of king who comes and judges the entire world for how it's responded to my gospel, to my inbreaking kingdom. And the whole thing, the whole way through is which team do you want to be on? Jesus is constantly calling people to make a decision around their acceptance or their rejection of him and the good news that he has been about proclaiming. And this has been the Gospel of Luke, right up to the house of Zacchaeus. And that's where we stopped, chapter 19. That's where we finished. 
And as we finished there, we saw that there were crowds of people who were following Jesus on the road to Jerusalem, en route to their uh, nation's spiritual capital for the Passover. That's what's going on. And they have just watched Jesus eat this meal with Zacchaeus, who's a chief tax collector. And then Jesus declares that he is a true son of Abraham who has received salvation. And this word salvation is evidence. It's a description that the kingdom of God has arrived in this guy's life. This meal has been a case study of what Jesus has come to do, to seek and to save the lost and make them a part of God's community, citizens of the kingdom. And no doubt, This meal, uh, this transformation of Zacchaeus, uh, this declaration about one of Israel's uh, most loathed identities begins to spread and trend even more up the Jericho Road all the way to Jerusalem. And expectation and even exacerbation around Jesus are at an all-time high. They are as high as they can get. And now Jesus stands in the shadow of Jerusalem on the Jericho Road on the eve of the Passover in anticipation about what will happen when he actually arrives in Jerusalem is off the chain. So Luke just casually tells us that while the crowd was listening to Jesus explain how this despised uh, traitor of his people is now a model citizen of the kingdom of God as as, as proclaimed by Jesus, he tells this parable because, because they're starting to go, man, this guy. And Luke gives us the reason for the parable, and it's twofold. The first reason is that because they're near Jerusalem, it's, it's just a day's walk, six or eight hours up the road, it's quite a hill. Uh, so Jesus is left with limited time, if you like, with his disciples, something they haven't understood. They haven't understood that Jerusalem is where Jesus goes to die. They are thinking that Jerusalem is where Jesus goes to um, bring in the kingdom of God. And because of that, They have a poor read on the arrival of the kingdom of God. They think it's going to be immediate. Like the great majority of this crowd, uh, they expect that when Jesus rolls into Jerusalem, he's just going to trigger the immediate restoration and consummation of the kingdom of God. That there would be this powerful eschatological end end of world event and Israel would enjoy political and religious peace and be able to practice their faith. And enjoy the blessing of God and those pesky Romans and all these other oppressors, gone. But for Jesus, the event that will take place is not one of overwhelming power through which God will will vindicate uh, the people of Israel, but one through overwhelming humility and death out of which Jesus will be vindicated. And his followers commissioned and empowered to live as as faithful servants in anticipation of the actual delayed uh, consummation of the kingdom of God. Jesus wants to correct their expectations of immediacy to, to delayed kingdom of God. Like, All the way through the book of Luke, we've been seeing how the kingdom has come, but it's come in part, not in its full expression. The true subjects will be expected to live in active anticipation and and, uh, participation of the coming full kingdom of God. They will be expected to be agents of the same kind of Uh, reconciliation and announcing of the kingdom of God and sharing of the gospel and the good news about Jesus that Jesus has actually been about. That is what is actually going to take place. And so the content of this parable is pretty straightforward. It tells uh, of a nobleman's interactions with two groups of people, his servants and some citizens and how they conduct themselves to, toward Jesus in his delayed return. Interesting, Jesus is actually drawing on an event that took place around the time of his childhood in AD 4. When Herod the Great died, he bequeathed um, the kingdom rule of Judea and Samaria to his son, Archelaus. 
However, in order for this rule to be valid, like Herod can go, yeah, no worries, son, you've got all of this. But in order for it to be valid, it required the approval of Rome. So Archelaus sets out to Rome. He goes on a journey to have Caesar confirm his kingship. But Archelaus is not a popular figure. He has killed some 3,000 Jews at a Passover. In fact, it was his tyranny that led to Jesus' family sitting on the outside, uh, outside of their normal home. They were trying to get back to Nazareth, but they get back into Galilee and they settle. You read about it in Matthew 22, uh, a little further out. Because this, this Archelaus is a nutcase. So some, some group of 50 Jews and Samaritans, and they don't normally get together too often, journey to Rome to appeal for a different king. They don't want this king, Archelaus, to rule over them. The appeal was lost. Archelaus is granted the title of uh, ethnarch, not king, but with the promise of kingship should he rule well. History tells us that he didn't, and he was deposed in 6 AD. Now, as Jesus stood on the road to Jerusalem, outside of uh, Zacchaeus' house, maybe going up, Herod's winter palace, the last person to live there was Archelaus, um, is probably visible. So Jesus kind of like, oh, I'm going to use that to generate some currency, if you like, some interest in, this, in, the, in the story I'm going to tell. It's kind of like clickbait. We're not meant to push the analogy too far. Parables are not designed to have every detail um, anal, analog, analog, what's that word? Dave's looking at me going, don't even try, brother. Um, compared to some kind, of, some kind of meaning. They are designed, a parable is designed to teach uh, a principle of core truth. That's what it's there to do. The point of this parable is not for us to anal, analogize. I cannot say that word. Thank you. Well, that's not it, but it's close. You know, Jesus with Archelaus. But to use these familiar circumstances to dismiss the idea that Jesus will immediately bring about the kingdom of God. And he's going to use some of the components of that story to tell his new story of what is going to take place instead of their expectations. A quick read of Luke's gospel, as I did on Monday, and you will see clearly that Jesus is a different kind of king with a different kind of kingdom than 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 one like Archelaus. So maybe if you meant to do anything between these two characters, it's contrast. But the main point is delay. Another question pushed across the table in this parable is, do you know the king you serve? Here is a parable that shows how faithful servants live out their king's commands. Have you, do you actually know the king? Have, have these people been listening to everything that Jesus has been saying? And if so, are they responding to what he's saying? For those who respond and live accordingly, this parable is telling us great reward. For those who don't, cataclysmic uh, judgment. However, in this king's absence, he, he, he gives gifts to his servants. Uh, he resources them with, with this miner uh, to multiply the wealth of his kingdom. And they are to put this money to work until he comes back. They are literally to make a profit. There is in this command an implied understanding that they will be required uh, to give an account of what they've done with the king's resources, with his generosity towards them when he returns. The point is... There will be delay, not immediacy, with respect to the consummation of the kingdom of God. In the meantime, the time that we are, oh, this is anticipating what we now experience. His servants, that's you and I, are to be about the continuing of his work of multiplying the good news of the kingdom as they have heard it, as they have received it, as they receive the story of Jesus now Go and multiply that. It's represented by this minor. We need to kind of get our, our, our Western kind of totally capitalistic, my brother would hate that, uh, worldview out of the, the way we see these minors. They're, they're, this is not merely a, a, a monetary thing. These are representing a gospel uh, kingdom story deposit in our lives. But just like 
uh, the case was with Archelaus, this nobleman in this parable uh, has some citizens who just outright reject his claim to being king. They do all they can to reject his rule over their lives. And they spend uh, the time of his absence and his delay opposing any claim he has and, and denying this, this spread of this gospel. But the nobleman, as we read on, uh, verses 15, is made king. And now he returns from his absence to see what his servants have done with, with what he left with them. And we, as we went through Hebrews, we, we kind of saw the behind scenes uh, coronation of Jesus. How following his death and resurrection, he ascends into heaven where he is acknowledged as the true king and the ruler of all things. He is the great high priest, cosmic king, uh, awaiting to return. Uh, and in that capacity, in his return to consummate his kingdom, uh, the mediator of the new covenant as we saw it, and when he comes rewarding faithfulness, rewarding those who persevere, rewarding those who faithfully live out uh, this Christian life. But also, as we read in uh, Hebrews, coming with fury and fire, consuming his adversaries. This is the return. When the king gets back from his journey, he gathers his servants, those who say they follow him, and he seeks to find out what they did with the deposit of his miner that he entrusted into their care. And two servants have seen the king's miner multiplied with great effect, like with 1,000% uh, growth and then 500% growth. And, and, and just note the king's response, like he's generosity regardless of whether it was a, a thousand percent or five hundred percent his uh response of generosity is still the same it, it's it's over the top and what's interesting about how they report their stories is that they do not talk like they are the ones who did all the work like they were operating with their assets and their capabilities they say your miner has earned 10 times and five times its value. It's as though the miner has an inherent power of its own. It's the miner that has been the means of its own multiplication. Their only involvement was to be faithful and to use it and put it in places where it could get to work. Their faithfulness in this is reflected in the king's response. He says, well done, my, yeah, you, you get me. You belong to me, my good servants. And the king's generosity is seen um, as faithfulness towards his delayed kingdom and, and continue operation in that leads to reward in his kingdom to come. These are people, the people perceived here, these servants are people who have perceived who Jesus is. This is the point. And they have understood his gospel and the nature of his kingdom. So while Jesus is away, um, so at that time they weren't seen, but we live in this now. They get about continuing his work with the gospel and, and the gifts, their minors, that he has given them. These are people like Zacchaeus who, having received the gospel of Jesus, just lives out its transforming effects regardless of personal cost. Their faithfulness to Jesus means not only do they get to keep what they first received from Jesus, but in the future kingdom, he generously and graciously gives them more. Like there's more waiting for them. Here is the take home message. While Jesus is gone, receiving his kingship, his true followers are faithfully uh, carrying out and continuing his work in the world by putting his gospel to work uh, through where they live, through the stories they tell, through the lives that they live. They are about the business of their king that they themselves have received from their king. They're not multiplying anything of themselves. They're multiplying what, what they've literally received. And then there's this other servant. And uh, whenever you're described as another type of anything uh, in, in, in the New Testament, it's never a good thing. Um, he's a kind of a hybrid, if you like. 
This servant has done nothing with the king's miner. In fact, he, he hid it in a handkerchief. Um, he hid it away and it played no active part in how he waited for the return of the king. And then when the king comes and asks him what he did with it, his defense of his non-action is to insult the master and accuse him of being a hard taskmaster and taking stuff that isn't his. When all this king has actually done is given this guy an invitation and an opportunity to use the stuff he gave him. The servant's accusations stand in stark contrast to the gracious generosity that the king has actually shown to, to other servants and indeed to him, revealing that this servant doesn't really know the king at all, doesn't know his heart, hasn't had that calm and, and, and transform him. The king does not refute the misplaced accusations, but he is silent toward them. But rather uses the servant's own words to judge him. If this is how you understood me, uh, why didn't you live accordingly? You knew, did you? It's kind of like, yeah, you, you knew, did you? Um, implying that this servant has kind of no idea of what the king is actually like, but, but will use his description, will use his words if you feared me as being overbearing and unfair, if you felt like I was the kind of king who asked too much of his servants, then, then why didn't you use my minor that I gave you accordingly and at least try to placate um, you know, my um, overbearing nature? Rather than just owning the fact you did, that you didn't have any confidence in what I'd given you or who I am, you, you've tried to paint me out as the problem, as someone who sets people up to fail or, or a king who is needy rather than needless. And so rather than receiving more of mine because you faithfully delighted in the little I gave you, you'll actually lose uh, what you received and its reward, uh, it, you know, the future enjoyment and participation in my kingdom will go to those who, who faithfully responded. Uh, this servant represents people who have heard the gospel and even taken their place in the community, but its power has not transformed, has no transforming effects in their lives so that it don't see Jesus as good, but rather they see Jesus um, as someone who is asking too much of them, asking them to give up too much. They value the life they have more than the minor. They call the minor, the, the, the call of the gospel in their lives that they have received. They haven't seen that what they surrender is replaced by an even greater reward in this current life and, and the one to come. And so they lose really what they never had and they don't gain what they could have had there is a um there is a possibility that this person represents someone who's received the gospel but hasn't lived faithfully with it but nevertheless because this guy we don't know he's out he's nothing he just loses the minor but it's not really told what happens to him he's not included with the next group who are put to death, so we don't know. He could be someone who just uh, gets into the kingdom of God, like one escaping the flames, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, but uh, I wouldn't risk it. The parable ends with the king addressing uh, his enemies, those who willfully and rebelliously reject his rule. They will face judgment for their treason. The finality and the severity of their faith represents the fact that, they, that, that there is um, no reversing of, God, of the judgment or, or there's no opportunity to change one's rejection of Jesus once he returns. Like you're not putting a DVD player in a, in a cassette player and go, oh, look, Jesus has come back and we got it all wrong. Let's go and that ain't happening. These people whose lives are lived 
in defiance of Jesus, they have heard the gospel and they find it offensive. These are people who have heard the gospel of Jesus. They have seen the kind of kingdom it builds and they hate it. They hate it with every fiber of their body. And, and they represent this furious fight against its growth in their life and in the world around them. That's who the enemies of Jesus are in this parable. Now, obviously, maybe not obviously, we don't need to be con convinced, uh, have our, our perception of the coming of the kingdom delayed. Like we understand that we live in the delayed period of time, that we live between uh, Jesus' first coming and his second coming. Like we get that. We have a pretty good grasp that we live in this period. The question that we must answer is what are we doing with our time? How have we responded to the gospel and the news about Jesus? Has it, uh, first of all, transformed our hearts? Has it enabled us to see Jesus as, as worth living for, as worth being a servant of, as a good and gracious and generous king? Have our hearts found a motivational confidence, a reason for living in what Jesus has done for us? Well, that's the, that's the first point. Do you understand who Jesus is, what he's like? And if it has transformed us, if it has made us true citizens of the kingdom, well, what are we doing with the resources that we have been given to live that life out, to retell that story of transformation, that story of good news, that story of entering into the kingdom of God? The good news of, of, of salvation in our hearts. That's what Zacchaeus is just before this. He's this case study of what it looks like. What are we doing? Are our lives organized around the anticipating the return of Jesus? That's what we've heard over the past three weeks. Have we become faithful storytellers, people who use what God has given us to share what God has done in us. Jesus is telling us that he is no stingy king, that he rewards generously those who live out their call to be his people. Like you cannot imagine what waits for us. Or are we stowaways in this community? Our hearts have no confidence in Jesus. We don't trust him with our lives. We don't see him as the source of grace, as someone who has dealt with our sin. The kind of person who has never truly walked through the door of faith that responds to the gospel of Jesus. Jesus is telling us that he is no foolish king. Stowaways will be made to leave their privileges lost and their room in the kingdom given to legit passengers. And this, this, this parable is like grace to that heart. Like it's time to punch your ticket. Or are you the furious fighter against the king and his gospel? Are you someone having heard that Jesus is offering a life in which sin is put to death and God's beautiful design is restored and you say, I want nothing to do with it. You can stick that somewhere else. You take that gospel and you jam it. This parable warns us that rejection of Jesus is met with the ultimate and final judgment. Essentially, you receive exactly what you invested your life into, and that is separation from God and ultimate death. To the degree that you respond to Jesus is the degree that Jesus rewards and judges. There are no second chances once the king returns. How our hearts are towards him when he returns fixes our place in eternity. As one kingdom fully disappears, powers and principalities of darkness and sin as it disappears, and the new one emerges in its fullness, how, how, how we participated in this life will determine where we spend the rest of eternity. That 
is what this parable is. This is a parable of grace. And it asks us to perceive who Jesus is and live out our lives as faithful servants until he returns with a promise of generous, gracious, purposeful, eternal living in his good and full kingdom. Hey, let's pray and let's get about the business of encouraging each other in that. Of encouraging each other and being citizens and storytellers and reproducers of what Jesus has done in our lives. Hey, loving God, we thank you uh, that even your strong warnings, your harsh words are like grace to us. They are telling us that we need to recognize our need of you. Uh, and, then, and then you just come and invest into us. And you bring newness of life that excites us and motivates us and turns us into the kind of people who are fit for your kingdom to come. And our prayer here is that more and more, uh, as we finish off this gospel, as we see who Jesus is, that that would enliven our hearts and that would enliven our lives uh, to the mission that you are calling us to as we wait uh, patiently but actively for your return. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.